Hey, Peter Franzen here from ChristianGeekCentral.com and Spirit Blade Productions, here to give you my reactions to the Game Awards 2018. If you're not familiar, uh, this is an event that's done once a year that not only kind of celebrates games and uh, honors different games with awards, very much like the Academy Awards, but also draws attention to new announcements and trailers and, and uh, things coming for new games in the future. So it's a little bit of like that uh, kind of like intersection of, of hype and uh, announcements and celebration that E3 is during the, the summer. So it's kind of a cool thing in the winter for a lot of video game fans to look forward to. I am not a lot of video game fans. I'm just one video game fan. So I'm not going to react exhaustively to the entire conference. I'm really going to limit my reactions to things that I particularly have things to say about that are related to my interests or that uh, particularly struck me for one reason or another as they came up in the uh, in the event. So uh, here we go. Uh, just going through in, in roughly chronological order. Um, first off, the first thing that caught my interest was the Stanley Parable. Uh, personally, I'm very interested in that. It's been on PC for a while and it was announced that in kind of like an ultra deluxe whatever edition, uh, it's going to be coming again to PC but also to consoles was the big news and I am really interested, I've been for a while interested to play that game and kind of see how they play with the idea of video games in general. It reportedly has a lot of meta humor based on video games and choice in games and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm really curious about that personally. I really feel like Jeff Keighley, the, the creator and host of the Game Awards, upped his game, so to speak, for this event, having this nice big orchestra, the production values are getting better every year, and more and more it's really reminding me of the classic Academy Awards or Emmy Awards type of show, and I suspect that's done with a purpose to maybe lend legitimacy to video games further, and you know, in some ways I feel like video games have come such a, a long way, they, in terms of their, you know, how much they earn, the video game industry is much bigger than the movie industry and has been for a while now, and so you would think that it would have gained legitimacy, quote unquote, in the eyes of the public uh, by now, and I think, you know, for many of, of a certain age, it has, but uh, still there seems to be an effort. I mean, that's what I'm guessing this is about. Uh, it, there seems to be an effort to lend some legitimacy, some class maybe, uh, to the hobby of video games. Maybe, dare I say, some significance, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. Um, moving along, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3 was announced exclusively coming to Nintendo Switch in 2019, which really surprised me. I still haven't finished. I've started it multiple times. I still have not finished the original Marvel Ultimate Alliance. The second one didn't catch, has never caught my interest as much because it seemed to be going away from the Diablo action RPG feel to leaning a little bit more in the direction of like a just a, an action co-op beat-em-up, which I'm less interested in. This one, uh, too hard to tell from the trailer if they're going to be leaning back into the more Diablo style of gameplay, which I would personally really like, but we'll see what happens. Uh, I, I would really be surprised if it stays exclusive to Switch forever. I'm thinking that's got to be like maybe just for 2019 and then it'll come to other consoles later on. I don't know. <laughs> really, really interesting. Uh, what was probably the highlight for me of the entire event was the announcement of Far Cry New Dawn, which is coming February 15th, which makes me think, my gosh, that's, that's really coming fast. There are a lot of other games coming out during that time that it's going to be competing with, but this is going to be a, a post-apocalyptic take of uh, on the, the Far Cry formula, that open world, first person shooting type stuff with vehicles that it looks like they're going to be scratch, trying to scratch some of that Mad Max itch that, uh, that, that players would enjoy seeing in the Mad Max movies like vehicles and stuff like that, or the Mad Max video game, which I really enjoyed. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to this. I have historically loved the Far Cry games, and I, I've kind of been wanting... In fact, at, after the end of Far Cry 5, um, which, you know, uh, spoilers a little bit, it ends with a nuclear holocaust, you know, but they, if you watch the Game Awards and you're tuning into my reactions here, they said as much, they already spoiled it for you. Um, 
But anyway, it ends in a nuclear holocaust. And I was thinking after that, boy, this could be a big game changer because after this in the timeline, they would have to go post-apocalyptic. And then maybe if, if after they get done with, get that out of their system, they would jump forward many, many years later. And who knows what they could do? Some kind of like rebooted civilization with now supernatural fantasy elements since they've played with supernatural stuff in the past. So there's so many crazy directions that Far Cry could go. Now that they've kind of finished trotting our globe, they are recreating the globe it seems like for the future. Then uh, we saw Ancestors Humankind Odyssey uh, a little bit later in the show and this is going to be a video game where you are playing the genetic ancestors of humankind uh, starting with apes of some kind and moving up to uh, on the evolutionary chain to uh, the the first human and so I suspect this is going to be a pretty controversial title at least maybe among uh, Christian circles and um, what I think we can take from this right now is, is is start thinking about how are we going to dialogue about this what it made me think about was not so much uh, you know how am I going to build a good argument for whatever you know my view is on this issue but how are we going to dialogue about this I think that there's uh, a lot of tendency for us when it comes to controversial issues um, to, to have a knee-jerk reaction that ends up coming across too intense. And whether or not, you know, what we're saying is, is true, it's not being received well because of the way that we communicate it, the tone that we communicate our views in. And so this was just kind of like a little uh, a, a, a note to self as I watched this. I was like, huh, interesting to watch this game, and it'll be interesting to see how we as Christians talk about this game. Um, and hopefully we'll do that with grace and truth at the same time. Outer Worlds was announced coming from Obsidian, which was recently purchased by Microsoft, and uh, it's assumed that it won't be long before all of their games are exclusive to Microsoft platforms like PC and, of course, Xbox One. But this one was given a, re uh, a release window of 2019 and had the PS4 logo along with the uh, the other console logos on there. And so, um, well, maybe not Switch, I can't remember, but it had Xbox One for sure and I think PC. And But anyway, so they're not going exclusive yet, maybe because you know that it's it's too far along in the plans to really derail it and just make it exclusive to Xbox One now. But I'm I'm glad that it will be coming to PS4. It looks interesting to me, like some kind of open world. I don't want to say post-apocalyptic. It looks like it's happening on another planet. It has that visual vibe to it, although like maybe steampunk post-apocalyptic. I don't know. It looks very interesting to me. So uh, I'm glad that it's going to be coming to the PS4, so I can at least uh, consider checking it out. Later on, BioWare came out, gave a teaser for uh, what you would be forgiven for not knowing, you know, what in the world <laughs> this game was. All they put up at the end was hashtag the Dread Wolf Rises, uh, which is a bit of a deep cut unless you're a hardcore Dragon Age fan. Uh, but this looks like a, uh, a teaser for the next Dragon Age game. It was a blip on my radar. I went and did a search on the hashtag. But, I mean, BioWare has really kind of fallen out of favor with me for a while now in terms of my faith in them creating the kinds of video game experiences I'm going to be interested in. So this is just like a, all right, well, that'll be interesting to see what that one looks like. Then there was a big uh, ad for Magic the Gathering, kind of a new online game that they have going for that. What interested me a lot more than the game itself that they were promoting is how they were promoting it. Um, they kept it, it was it was done a little bit tongue in cheek, but they the the whole ad was about how man if you win this tournament that we're planning, then this person in your life will know, and this person will know, and this person will know, and this person will know, and famous people will know, and this person you know. Uh, it's really just and, and the the final tagline was the world will know. Like if you win this championship, the world will know. And that really caught my attention, along with the, you know, the, my thoughts about the event as a whole. With all this pomp and circumstance, I, now, let me, let me be clear, I love, you know, uh, watching a celebration of some nerdy thing that I like. I come away from things like this in E3, and I'm just reminded, man, I got some cool games. You know, this is a really fun hobby that I enjoy a lot. But... I, it's a fine line, I think, between celebrating our hobbies and lifting them up and giving them significance that they should not have in our lives. 
And having a, a, an ad campaign that's built around the idea of, hey, if you win, all these people are going to take notice of you. It's attaching your significance to how well you do in a game. And I don't think our significance is tied to certainly not how well we do in a video game, but I don't think it's tied to how well we do in anything in life. And now more than ever, we live in a climate where issues of identity are so important to people. And yet we tend to attach our identity to all the wrong things, to our uh, sexual orientation or tendencies, to our ethnicity, to our cultural backgrounds, to our achievements, whether that be in our work life or in our gaming life. I'm battling the temptation to attach my significance to the, the, the content or the art that I create. Uh, it's, it's just something that's very much all over Western culture right now, I think. And a single read through the first few chapters of the book of Ephesians shows us that our identity is found in the fact that God loves us. For whatever reason I cannot fathom, he has invested so much love in these creatures that he has created called humanity. And when we begin to understand how like immensely holy and other and grand and amazing God is beyond comprehension, the fact that he loves us and has invested himself in us, that gives us far more significance than any attention we could get, any praise or compliments or appreciation we could get from anyone else. And so seeing that ad for the, uh, for the Magic the Gathering campaign um, made me just kind of want to stop and check myself and say, huh, am I allowing the way that video game companies talk about their games, or am I allowing game experiences themselves or fiction itself to further fan the flames in me that would naturally cause me to gravitate toward finding my significance in what I do, in what I accomplish, in being the great hero, you know? That's what our fiction tends to be about, is one unique person rising above and being super significant and saving the day. And in a similar vein, I think um, when we as gamers have maybe faced criticism, whether it's been outright or just kind of passive aggressively implied by other people, people in our lives, that our hobbies, maybe gaming specifically, are just kind of worthless, you know, or unsophisticated or whatever. I think that there can be a, a knee-jerk reaction on our part to overcompensate and build up video games as being, you know, not just worthwhile forms of entertainment, but more significant than they are. And I wonder if events like this potentially can feed into that tendency inside of us. I also think about when was the last time I felt this sense of eager anticipation about sharing a common love with other people, not for video games, but for Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that our worship services should, you know, start to resemble rock concerts or events like this, but it does make me pause and think a little bit. Is there some parallel there um, between an event like this and what worship will be in the new heaven and new earth? You know, right now we don't uh, usually have events like this just celebrating some facet of who God is because there's so much about God that he has not revealed because we're not ready for it yet. This is still a time for people to make their choices about who they want to spend eternity with. But once those choices are made, I just can't help but wonder, what will it be like? Will we have big events where big crowds will gather and big presentations will be made celebrating some facet of who God is or what he's made or what he's done? Do events like this speak to our desire to really draw attention to, fixate on, and worship something that is bigger and elevated and above and beyond the mundane that we live in every day. Anyway, nothing conclusive that I really want to say about any of that. Uh, I just think there are some interesting parallels that uh, are worth taking a moment and, uh, and thinking about before we head into our next Sunday morning worship service or as we think about what eternity in Christ's kingdom might be like. Finally, Rage 2 is coming out May 14th. We saw another trailer for that. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to that. It looks like it might be my kind of game. I, 
I'm not sure. It might be a little too action heavy. I like the pace of Far Cry where you can be kind of stealthy in the first person, you know, shooter open world. Uh, and this looks like it might be a lot more focused on just going in guns blazing all the time with no sniping options available, which would be a little bit of a bummer for me. But Avalanche, who's making this game, also made the Mad Max game, and it looks like they're bringing over the knowledge they gained from the uh, doing the vehicle combat in that game into this. And so the the post-apocalyptic vehicle con uh, combat of Rage 2 is something that I'm uh, really looking forward to. If you haven't noticed by now, I'm not commenting on really any games that won awards because I awards don't really mean that much to me except to say that, oh boy, a large number of people all had similar feelings about this game. In my experience, that that is not an indicator at all of <laughs> what I'm going to enjoy. But if for some reason you're curious about what I would call the best games of 2018, then stay tuned sometime during the week uh, between Christmas and New Year's. I will be putting up a video that I already recorded this week. I'm still in the process of editing where I run down my top 10 best games of 2018. Uh, I'm really excited to share that with you guys. I hope you'll come back for that. And also that you'll join us at ChristianGeekCentral.com as we continue to geek out and seek the truth. Right now I'd like to take some time to write a tune for pre-made rhyme. The lyrics kind of never change, but the melody gets rearranged. I never know what I'll create to say how much I appreciate. Libre, Stefan Kramick, and Barbells, and Joysticks, thank you for supporting me, and SBP, and CGC, and now to all who hear this tune. Thank you as well. Please come back soon. Want to hear your name. In song check out our page on Patreon. Alright, I maybe didn't write that, that tune in truth.